uh, this is our, our first time doing this seminar series. And the intent here is to provide a venue whereby world-class researchers can interact with young people across the continent of Africa. And, and we're really um, benefiting from our dream team, which are primarily based in Kenya, which are young people who've, who've graduated from Moy University. And these are really a dynamic and interesting and, and very, very intelligent group of young people who are front facing with farmers. But oftentimes they, they require more technical information, especially as things like fall armyworm or climate change are, are ever changing and ever um, modifying depending upon local conditions. And so we heard uh, Dr. Red Harrison speak last week at the FAO webinar, and he is now our inaugural uh, present presenter for this series. And we hope this series will grow into many, many similar experts. Um, Dr. Harrison is, is a, a world-renowned uh, ecologist uh, focusing on applied research in agroecology. He has over 25 years experience in tropical landscapes, and he works for uh, the World Forestry Agro Institute based in, in, in Lusaka in Zambia, and he's been there since 2013. And he has played a really important role in the reimagined Fall Army Warm Global Action campaign or plan, uh, particularly as he runs one of the technical steering groups on agroecology and he gave really an excellent pres presentation. So the idea is he's going to run through some slides here and we want to as quickly as possible get into questions and answers because he needs to hear from uh, you all uh, as young researchers and you you all need to be able to ask him direct questions. So uh, Rhett, thank you so much for joining us and uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, so um, what I'm what I'm going to do is just show the the some of the slides that I showed at FAO. It's the same uh, slide talk, but uh, I'll flick through some of the earlier ones, and we can focus on maybe one or two of the uh, more um, interesting uh, topics for discussion. Um, so there's a little bit at the beginning, as you remember from that talk, about the sort of background of uh, agroecological approaches to pest management. And then there's something about the global trial that we are trying to implement uh, um, as part of a research into how to control full army worm with, with these kinds of approaches. So I will uh, share my screen. Um, let me see, where can I find it? Here we go. So I hope you can see that. Yeah. yeah so yeah. let me just uh, uh, flick down through this. So. Um, so first of all, yeah, when um, we're talking about insect pest management, the uh, it, a lot of people conceptualize it in in this fashion that there's this pyramid of action that uh, we use um, with on the bottom layer there a whole a, a series of different uh, management approaches that limit the um, abundance of the pests. So they they do this by, for example, increasing host plant re uh, resistance mechanisms such as mechanical control, biological control, um, and sort of things like landscape management. And of course, agroecology and, and those types of controls fit into that, that uh, things. So these are actions that are taken um, as a way to manage um, the crop uh, from the beginning and not specifically uh, this pest. And so they're generally implemented against any, um, any pest that may be in the field. Um, the other thing to bear in mind is these are decisions that are taken sort of when you manage the landscape, when you manage the crop. So the costs of these are part of your regular um, crop management costs. These are upfront costs that you, you bear. And then as you move up the pyramid, you then have your monitoring and scouting your threshold. So if you suspect you have a pest in your field, you need to go out and, and assess the uh, its abundance and the damage it's doing, and whether you, you know, whether you feel that that has passed a threshold, and then if it has passed a threshold, um, and those thresholds ideally are economically determined to, with a prediction of how much yield you would lose without action, um, and then the cost of the of the either the biopesticide or synthetic pesticide, um, and the the yield that that the application of those. Um, those interventions would make. So in other words, if, if you're gonna lose $10 uh, per hectare 
from, uh, from pests and your pesticide costs $5 uh, per hectare, then the action obviously would be to go and spray. On the other hand, if it costs $15 per hectare to spray, then your action is to do nothing and just suffer that level of damage. Um, so in agroecology, we have these different um, main approaches. Um, I, I should also add that agroecology is more than just what I'm talking about, the essentially the ecological part of it. It is also about um, uh, food sovereignty. Um, it's about uh, communities and individual farmers, farming communities, determining how they want to manage their land. That is not necessarily being dictated to by um, large uh, industrial agriculture um, and so forth. And one of the most important things, of course, is uh, seed sovereignty as well. Um, so it, it's, it's, a, it's a socio-political movement as well as being based on um, agro, um, ecological principles in, at the field scale. Um, but, it, but obviously in this uh, talk, I'm, I'm focusing on the ecological principles. So we have these three main thrusts. The first one being that you want to have a healthy plant so you're practicing things like crop rotation and tillage, mulching, composting. The aim here is to build up, um, uh, particularly with the mulching and the composting, to build up good soil organic uh, carbon content um, in your soils. Um, one of the problems that you can get with um, pests, and this applies to fall armyworm, if you fertilize uh, plants on uh, very poor soils, you can get them to grow, um, but they often have a very imbalanced uh, nutrition. And one of the things that they uh, have is high levels of amino acids in the leaves. And this is a little bit like waving a flag to the pests. Um, it's sort of like you who with something good to eat over here. Um, whereas when you when you have a more balanced release of those nutrients and uptake of those nutrients by the by the plant then the, the nutrition is more balanced and they, they have a better balance between structural uh, compounds that uh, make them not so attractive to pests, um, as well as the important nutritional uh, content for, um, for growing and for also putting into the seed. So, um, so the, the aim is to, or, or one of the most important indicators there is the amount of soil organic carbon. It's also a good indicator of the ability of the plant to withstand factors such as uh, dry, dry periods and so forth, because the, the soil organic carbon is a strong indicator of the water uh, holding capacity of the soil. Um, and it's also, and flooding as well, uh, when you have very heavy rain, you know, high soil organic carbon tends to indicate that soils are more permeable. Um, there are exceptions to that where you've got uh, peat soils or something sitting over an impervious layer, but um, at least on a mineral soil, it's, it's indicator of a, of a healthy soil with healthy biology um, that, that holds water well. Um, and then we look at biodiversity. So there's the general principle that if you increase biodiversity at different scales, both in your plots, around your farm scale and at the landscape scale, you are providing ecosystem services to the, uh, the farming system. And these include things like pollinators and natural enemies. And then the last one is um, specific interventions that, that would encourage natural enemies. So this is where, this is often the case that you're replacing something that's missing from the landscape um, without an intervention. So in the case of, uh, for example, bats, um, most agricultural landscapes have very few large trees. So many bats would be uh, roosting in large hollow trees. And so unless you provide artificial bat roosts, you're, you're not going to have anything like the same density of bats um, in this uh, landscape. So you provide some bat roosts. Insect hotels, the same kind of idea. Uh, if you don't have dead wood that uh, many of these insects like to, to bury, burrow into, then you're not going to have um, the density of, of, for example, predaceous uh, uh, beetles. So you need to provide the, those kind of resources. So it's specific interventions targeted at increasing the abundance of a particular natural enemy. And the point is with these, these interventions is that you can integrate them in different ways. 
um, and as I, I think I stressed in the FAO presentation, that you, you have all of these options, but you don't necessarily have to apply all of them. Farmers, I, they, they may find that one or other of the, for example, maybe perhaps they don't like minimum tillage because dealing with the weeds is, it can, can be uh, problematic with, with minimum tillage. Um, so, so they don't do the minimum tillage, but they do do the mulching, they do do um, the agroforestry and, and, and other things, and, and the diverse margins, and so on. So it's, it, the, the idea is that it's, it's a philosophy, in a sense, to how you manage your fields, trying to the services that you get from nature, but it doesn't require that um, the farmer necessarily adopts all of this, which of course would be quite complicated. So perhaps um, we should pause there and, and maybe take some questions or some discussion from the from the audience. Oh. Super. Um, yep. Yeah. yeah. So there was one question posted already. Um, so it was by Bonfoss. Uh, all pests mutate over time and fall armyworm is not an exception. Should we be worried of more fall armyworm strains in the future due to climate change? Um, so this is more of a worry to the sort of low diversity approaches to pest management. If you're using, for example, GMO, you know, so, so ge genetically engineered crops, or pesticides, then you get very, well, even managing it, and certainly without managing it, you can get very quick evolution of, of pest resistance. So for um, against the BT strain GMO, it's only about 60% effective in the US at the moment because of uh, the evolution of resistance. Um, those figures are probably a little bit uh, uh, lower here, so maybe only about say say it's about eighty percent, but no, nobody knows for sure. Um, because when it in invaded Africa, a lot of these resistance seems to have uh, been lost. Uh, because one of the main pesticides that uh, um, fall armyworm is resistance to in the U.S. is chlorophos, and most farmers here are using that, and they seem to get away with it, which suggests that it's kind of lost that resistance temporarily. But we might expect if there's widespread use of those pesticides for them to re-evolve it very quickly. Um, with agroecological approaches, because you're using natural enemies and you're using a, you know, a, a wide diversity of approaches to control your pest, um, there's essentially, you know, it's a natural system in, in effect or a, a managed natural system. So you, you would not expect anything like the, um, the same risk of some, for example, mutation occurring that, that makes the pest much, much worse. Great, thank you. Um, and if there's any follow-up questions from Rhett's answer, you can type them in the chat as well. So we had another question come in then, um, does, from James, does combining synthetic pesticides with biopesticides uh, is it harmful? Are there any antagonistic reactions? Um, to my knowledge, no, but it, it would be combining two approaches that have rather different philosophies. So the, 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 bio, the principle of the biopesticide is that you're, you're putting out a, usually a microorganism in this case, um, that fights the 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 uh, uh, the pest, and one of the problems with the, the perception of biopesticides among farmers is that often these microorganisms don't kill the pest immediately. They can sometimes take up to a week or ten days to to kill the pest, but the pest is sick, and so it's not eating. So even though it's not dead, it's not dropping off the leaf. It's not nearly as or it might be eating a little bit, but it's, it's not causing a lot of damage. And the idea is that, for example, if it's a fungi the, or, or a virus, the, the, the fungi and the virus are multiplying within the body of the pest. And then it's, uh, when it dies, they, they then go on and spread to other pests, uh, caterpillars in the field. So if you, if you spray 
uh, with a synthetic pesticide, which basically has a knockdown effect, you know, particularly a contact pesticide, um, you're expecting them to literally sort of either get it on the body or immediately feed on it and they die straight away, then you're actually interrupting that process. So you're not allowing the biopesticide to multiply on, the, on, the, on its host and then infect the other caterpillars in the field. So it would kind of be a bit pointless to do it that way around. Yeah. And I might, I might also add that there are interesting ways that you can think of either using biopesticides or also using things like uh, push-pull. So in the traditional, maybe I shouldn't say traditional, but in the ECP um, system of push-pull, the drought tolerant push-pull that they've come up with, you, you have desmodium in the field, which is a very uh, strong, um, it produces lots of volatiles that the, the caterpillars don't like. Um, it's also very effective against strider as well. Um, and the idea is that the pest doesn't, they don't like the volatiles, so they go and they look for food elsewhere, and then they get attracted to the bracharia grass in the, in the boundary. Now, the thing with, um, with um, fall armyworm is fall armyworm, when you look at feeding preferences, it always chooses to feed on maize over anything else. So using brachiaria as, as the, um, the alternative is probably not gonna work in a lot of situations. So it might work in a situation where the entire place is, um, uh, well, or, or where you've just got a small um, maize field, say on the edge of a, either, you know, savanna grasslands or, 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 um, or a forest or something. But in a situation where you, 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 um, you, you have lots of maize, it, eventually it's gonna go for the maize more. Um, so actually another strategy is that you can actually plant patches of maize, which you do not intercrop and they become the trap crop. So everything leaves the main crop, lands in the maize, and then you treat that. So the, and this is where it would actually be advantageous to either use biological control. So you treat it with, you release your, your biological agents and then the trap crop becomes the area in which those can, they can multiply up. They can, they can lay their eggs in, in the eggs or the, the caterpillars and they increase the population. Or if you're using a biopesticide, it's where the fungi or the virus can, can infect the things, multiply up and then be effective over the entire area. So, um, I think there are many ways we can think of how to use the biology of, of, um, of these um, control agents and, and this kind of concept of pushing and pull. Um, it doesn't have to just be this system of having the bracharia grass around the edge. As, as, although that was very effective in, in, its, in the situation that was studied by SCP, um, I think there are many other ways we can think of using it. That's very interesting. Um, I know that, at least from our team side, they're going to take that away and really invest in um, testing that with demo plots in our area. So that, that's really exciting um, to hear from you about. There was another question posted by Matthew. Um, so he says, I read an article somewhere that presence of weeds reduce fall armyworm infestation by increasing the number of natural enemies. Is there a specific weed that will not compete with the maize crop for nutrients when left to grow between rows of the maize plant? Yeah, this is a much talked about uh, topic in the sort of agroecological approaches to uh, full army one and, and other pests. The agronomists, strict agronomists hate the concept because of this risk of increasing the number of weeds in the field and then competing with your, um, with your, um, with your crop plants. Um, but as an ecologist, um, it, it makes a lot of sense. You put weeds in your field, you're gonna increase the diversity, you're gonna have a lot more biology going on. Um, I think um, the, I mean, in terms of a specific weed, um, I don't, I can't really answer that. Um, uh, what there was one uh, study in Nicaragua where the the um, person what they did was they managed the weeds so that there was a a path between the weeds and the the maize plants so they hoed a narrow row 
between the maize plants and the and, and the weed strip. Um, and so that is perhaps a way that it could be managed so that it's not competing directly. So because they had, you know, a sort of 30 centimeter gap. Um, so, and, and if you're doing double alley planting, so that's what we use with the intercropping. We, we, we have two rows of maize and then we intercrop it. The reason we do that is because you get much better growth of the intercrop when you have a wider gap and more light coming in. So instead of having, so normally in Zambia, they plant 75 meter apart rows. Uh, it'll be drier in systems, it'll be further apart in systems that are a bit drier. Um, so what we do is we have the, the, the rows of, of maize are just, uh, I think it's uh, 40 centimeters apart. And then you have a gap, which is um, 110 centimeters, which is the integral. And that's where we plant the, 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 the two rows of beans, usually uh, uh, cow pea or, or something like that. Um, and you could think of doing the same with weeds so that you have a, a bigger gap between the, uh, the, the system. The other thing, perhaps the only in, the, in line with it, more directly answering your question is that it's very clear that grasses are a very strong competitor of the crop. Where you get grasses coming in as weeds, they really suppress the growth of the crop. So maybe if you were able to somehow weed out the grasses, but leave some of the other weeds, perhaps that would be a way of, of managing the competition. But um, these are not well tested um, ideas. Um, there hasn't really been any research into it other than this PhD from Nicaragua where they, they cleared the strips. Um, and they found that that was quite effective. They, they found that the, the weeds uh, supported the higher populations of natural enemies, but didn't compete with the crop. Well, thank you. That's really interesting. So one more questions come in um, from Winnie. What is the best model to study tree crop interactions in agroforestry? And if so, how do we prevent antagonism between the two so that none will be negatively affected at the end? So between the tree crop, tree and crop. Yeah. Do you mean a specific species of tree do, or things? Well, I, I mean, the, the, the answer to that question is that, you know, uh, we, you know, that, in a sense, that, that is the, the critical um, question in agroforestry, at least where you're actually intercropping with agroforestry, is how, how do you manage the, the competition between your, your tree and, and, and your other, and your annual crops? Um, so uh, in much of uh, Africa, you, we have this uh, tree called Fidebia albida, uh, which is very interesting because it has this reverse phenology where it, um, where it loses its uh, leaves when the cropping season starts, when the rains first begin. And so not only does it reduce the, the light competition, but that also means that it drops its fertile leaves and it also reduces the, the competition for water. So it's kind of, your, in a sense, a perfect uh, agroforestry uh, tree, but it, it's exceptional. It's, it's very unusual. Um, and so we, we can't take that as typical for all situations. Um, so when you're thinking of agroforestry, you, you, you have to think of um, how you manage that space. And you, there are models available where you can, um, where you can calculate this. APSIM uh, uh, is, is one of them. Um, but in general, you have to accept that there will be um, uh, trade-offs so that there will be uh, synergies, but there's also trade-offs. And so when this, the trade-offs cancel the synergies, then you're, you're not getting any net benefit. And so that's the point to say, you know, that's enough cover. So in a coffee system, for example, um, once your shade gets more than 30%, uh, you're, you're, you're losing value in your crop. So you, you can't let the shade get above 30%. Um, in silver pastoral systems, they're often, um, it, um, although I should point out that does also vary with uh, factors such as elevation and, and so forth as well. Um, in silver pastoral systems, it's lower. Usually silver pastoral systems are more like uh, 5% or 10%. Um, 
so um, yeah, and a lot of farmers elect, they prefer to plant the trees at the um, boundaries of their fields rather than actually intercropped with the fields exactly for that reason. It, it enables them to gain some benefits from things like uh, access to shade, from shelter, um, from things like the services of live fencing, the, the timber, but it doesn't create a direct uh, competition with, with the annual crops. So, you know, so you can manage the competition in different ways. You, you, you can, you don't have to have them intercropped. You can also do boundary trees or, even, or wood lots. There are different ways to use trees on the farm um, to exactly to manage that, that issue. Yeah. You mentioned there was a model to determine like the appropriate amount or spacing. Can you repeat the name of that, please? It's called APSIM, A-P-S-I-M. It's uh, produced by, uh, from the CSIRO, the, 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 the authors of it. Um, but it's, it's got numerous modules, including an agroforestry module, which was actually written by a co colleague of mine. Excellent. All right. Um, so there, just as an, uh, um, an idea so that you understand the value. So the, in the silver pastoral systems in the US, they were able to increase the productivity of dairy cattle this, um, by about 40% and because they had access to shade. So a lot of cows, when they don't, when, if they overheat in the field, the productivity goes right down. So access to shade was extremely important for, for dairy in the US. Obviously that's worth a lot. And I know also in Kenya, there was some research done which found that access to fodder trees um, so during the dry season, when the quality of the grass fodder goes down, being able to eat the, the leaves of, of um, fodder trees like sesbania, that um, uh, increases the productivity of cows. And I think it was valued at between 62 and 114 or something like that. The numbers don't quite stick in my head, but it was substantial per cow, dollars per cow per year. So it's a substantial amount of money having that the cows have access to uh, shade and fodder trees um, in the system. Well, it's really um, interesting to hear about and, and relevant to another project within Plant Village, which I know um, one of our leads, Dr. Catherine Karungo, is a part of the attendees. So I'll be excited to, to talk with her about that um, afterwards. Thank you. So we had some more questions come in. Um, so from Matthias, how long does it take to destroy the fall armyworm production cycle when using synthetic pesticides? I mean, so the way this most, so there's two types of synthetic pesticides. There's the, there's this systemic where the, the pesticide is taken up into the plant, either through the roots or through the leaves. And then the, the pest feeds on, on, the, uh, on the leaf and, and, I, and doesn't like it as an edge, but also gets sick and dies. Um, those are less common. Uh, most of the synthetic pesticides are knocked down, contact pesticides. So they, they are absorbed into the body of the, uh, the pest, usually through the skin, directly from the mist that's sprayed, or sometimes through um, feeding on the leaf. And they they um, they kill the pest basically straight away. If at, I mean, or at, at the level of um, effectiveness they are. The thing about the fall armyworm is that it hides in the well of or at least the larger ones. That from the third instar onwards, it goes down into the well, and so it actually gets very little exposure to contact pesticides. There are strategies to try and deal with that. For example, spraying at night. So um, the Companies that operate drones, they usually advocate spraying at night because the caterpillar comes out of the well a little bit more at night. Um, so that's one way of, of trying to do with it. Um, but um, to be honest, it's, it's, they're not really that effective. So the most effective ones are the systemic ones, uh, but they're much less used. Uh, so um, the, the thing I would say about um, 
the pesticides is that you can use botanical pesticides. These are things like neem um, and other plants uh, that, that uh, contain plant toxins. Um, and they have been shown to be just as effective. There's a study from Ethiopia um, that looked at three different um, botanical pesticides and compared them to the, the best synthetic pesticides. And they found that the botanicals were just as effective. Um, so there's really, you know, given that the botanicals do much less damage to the, the natural enemy community, um, and they are as cheap or, or even cheaper if they're homemade, um, there doesn't really seem to be a reason to use uh, synthetic chemicals. I mean, I certainly would suggest that it's, it's not a good idea. Um, they, of course, the botanicals work by a slightly different mechanism. Most of them are feeding disruptors. So what that means is that the, the animal, the pest, does not like eating the leaf as much, um, and they get a bit sick. They don't like it. So they just don't grow very effectively. So you, you get very small caterpillars that then grow into small moths that have very few eggs and so forth. It doesn't, it doesn't knock them down in the way that a synthetic pesticide is designed to do so. But they're just as effective in reducing the damage on the crop. Yeah, and with the botanicals as well, it's less harmful than um, the synthetic pesticides. So for a lot of the farmers that our team is working with, they don't have the correct um, protective equipment to apply the pesticides. Um, so that's also a good contributing factor as well. Very definitely, very definitely. I mean, um, it's, it's not really my work, it's work by uh, Paul Jensen, but he's published a number of papers showing just how, I mean, we are suffering from an epidemic of pesticide abuse in, in, uh, in Africa, and, and it really is a serious problem. I mean, the health services of, of African countries and, and uh, people are going to be dealing with this problem for many decades to come because it causes cancers, it, it, you know, it, it's just, it's a very, very serious problem. And because it's, except in a, a cases of acute poisoning, like when somebody drinks a pesticide or something, it rarely, people maybe go to bed feeling a bit sore in the head or a bit sick or something like that, but they, they don't get ill beyond that. But when they do that and then they go back in the field the next day and, and so on, it, it, it builds up over the lifetime of the work of the farmer and you know after five six years you suddenly the farmer's got got cancer or something like that so it is a, it, you know a, it's a it's a chronic problem in terms of the health of the farmers um and it's, it's a serious one and, and another important one that's often admitted is that the um, um, young mums or mums that have um, are in utero um, and young children are often part of the fa the family farm labor and if they go back into the field before the, the time period when you're not supposed to re-enter the field, which is usually about um, two weeks, then they are also exposed to those chemicals and, and that can have very serious uh, uh, consequences for the development of the, uh, of the child. Yeah, I was just reading a, a case study that had been done, I believe in Cambodia, I wanna say about how they opened up women's schools uh, for education because they were working in the fields and they typically worked during the times right after they had just sprayed. And so um, the women, especially with the young children, would be in these fields right after they'd sprayed and it was causing all these health issues that just weren't being connected. But then once they put in the time and um, infrastructure for building these schools and educating and holding a community-wide discussion on what's been happening and how that can be linked to it, then all of us, then it was um, found that it was linked to the pesticides and they were provided with the correct protective equipment. The children weren't coming to the fields anymore and, and um, the health status really increased for that community. So, uh, Okay, great. Uh, so we have another question then from Liverson. Uh, so the level of attack by fall armyworm reduces on zero tillage or conservation agriculture applied fields. And so how does this concept apply? I believe, how does this method actually work um, technically? 
Yeah, I mean, one of the unfortunate things is that, well, first of all, there are often different pathways, different pathways for the mechanisms to work. Um, I mean, that's typical in ecology. It's rarely a single pathway. Um, but the other thing is that our knowledge of the mechanisms is, is a, a lot further behind the, the tests on the thing. So it's a, the results as we understand them are more phenomenological. You, you, you apply a control plot and a minimum tillage plot, and you see that in the minimum tillage plot, you get lower rates of uh, fall army worm damage. And so you have a result, but what, how that's exactly happened is, is more difficult to say. Um, but uh, we can certainly talk about um, what would be the suggested pathways. So the first thing is that in a minimum tillage uh, situation, you get more uh, natural enemies in the fields. So th this has been shown by people who've, who've done those kind of experiments and then also trapped the na natural enemies. So you do get higher populations of natural enemies. That's the first thing. And it's not surprising because uh, when you have a healthy soil biology, which you, you get from not disturbing the soil, you've got, uh, you've got more organisms in that soil, more, uh, you've got more bacteria and so forth, and you've got more organisms eating that bacteria, and then you've got more insect predators eating those organisms. So you, you just got a more lively uh, biology. Um, the other uh, factor is probably related to the health of the plant and particularly the plant nutrition. And that is the, um, the, the fact that uh, minimum tillage soils tend to hold water. So you don't get this uh, a problem with, uh, particularly if it's a light soil where you've got high drainage, they can, you know, just a couple of days of without rain and they can suffer, they can suffer water stress because the roots don't go very deep. Whereas when you've got minimum tillage, the, the, the water holding capacity is much higher. So it takes a much longer period, many more days before you, you get a, a water stress kicking in on the plant. So that, that makes the, the plant more, more robust and, and more able to fend off damage. I mean, in many cases, maize has a tremendous capacity to recover from damage. So if, it, if it's a healthy plant that can regrow, it can, you know, particularly if it's in the younger stages, it can be quite badly attacked by full armyworm. And by the time it's uh, ready for harvest, you'd never know. It's, it's, it's a fully recovered plant. So a lot has to do with just growing the, the healthy plants, the healthy nutrition, uh, the, the waters, the, the fact that they have access to water. Um, Great. Um, kind of in line with this, um, one of Marion in the chat had mentioned how she has an observation um, that in most of the farms that she's visited in, and she's coming from um, Bomboma County in, in Kenya, um, that the crops around the border where the trees are also growing don't do so well um, is an observation. So I'm not sure if you have anything to comment on that. Yeah, I mean, it's a little difficult to say, but if it's very close to the trees, then um, there are two mechanisms are, are likely to be happening. Um, one would be that there's um, some shade from the trees uh, because crops like maize, they're, they're, they're sun loving crops. And so they need to, they really need to be in full sun. So that, that's one, probably the most likely. And then this, but the second possibility of course, is that there's, um, if, if it's a, a situation in which there may be competition for water, there, there could also be some effect of, of the fact that the tree is drawing, the trees are drawing water out from under the crop. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So another question coming in from Marcel and Suma. Uh, so when the fall armyworm larvae is crushed, mixed with water and sprayed on the other larvae, they die. Do you have a scientific explanation for this? Um, and then one of our other members had commented and said that extension expertise in Tanzania has applied this method, but the criteria was that the fall armyworm should be dried up under the shade, but not directly in the sun. I don't know what the science with that is. I mean, I can't see how that would work unless the caterpillar is somehow infected. 
So if it's infected with a virus or, or a fungus, then that is exactly how you can multiply it. You, you, you just um, you collect the infected caterpillars off the leaves, scrunch them up, put them in, in a sprayer, uh, and blend them, put them in a sprayer, and then spray them on, on the other caterpillars. So um, I'd imagine that that's what it's connected to. So that because a, a perfectly healthy caterpillar is not going to somehow, uh, you know, kill the other caterpillars. So I, I imagine that they must have somehow been diseased or or or, or um, had a fungal infection or something. I have um, one interesting thing that might also make for an interesting small project. Um, so I know that FAO has done some work on trying to see if it's economically viable to pick the caterpillars, to just go along the field picking the caterpillars. And they were paying pickers to do this. Now, from my own experience, um, the, basically the result was it's, it's not. It, it, it's very time consuming. It's very difficult to do. But uh, from my own experience um, in trying to collect and count caterpillars, um, because they're down in the world, it's very difficult to get access to them. And you actually, you often damage the plant a bit because you have to open it up in order to get the caterpillar out. So, you know, every caterpillar you find is actually quite time consuming to extract. But what I have also noticed is that when you get rain, the, the wells fill up with water, and then the caterpillar has to come out of the well in order to, to stop, to avoid drowning. So it just sits on the leaf. So uh, I suspect that if you try picking immediately after a heavy rain shower, it can actually be potentially very effective because you could just literally walk around and just pick them straight off the leaf. So I think that that would be kind of an interesting little student project would be to see whether or not you could design, just modify this, this concept of, of doing picking to, to optimize it to when is best to pick the, to pick the, um, uh, the caterpillars. I also suspect that there's a strong interaction between rainfall and natural enemies. I, I like I say, I suspect we don't have any evidence for it, but, um, when you get rainfall, as I say, the caterpillars come out and then they're very vulnerable to being parasitized and, and, and so forth. Whereas when they're down in the well, it's actually quite difficult for the natural enemies to get at them. Um, which is one of the reasons why I feel that this, um, some of these approaches are perhaps more effective where you do have um, higher rainfall and, heavy, and especially heavy rainstorms compared to some of the drier environments where maize is grown. Yeah, that would be really interesting to test and potentially give more advice out to farmers on picking after it rains because I know the team and also myself have experienced uh, after a heavy rain in the field, you can find dead larvae um, in the pools of the world from the water collecting. Um, so the ones that maybe were smart enough to get out ahead of time, they it would be quite easy to just pick them from the leaves there. Yeah. Hmm. Great. So um, maybe I, I talk about the global trial and then see if this anybody would like to um, to participate in that or have any questions about that. Yeah. yeah. So I mentioned this as well. Um, so I'll just share my screen again. Uh, let me see if I can find. Oh. No, I have to go to here, I think. And then, um, so you can see that, I hope? Yes, we can yes. see. Oops. So, yes, the global trial. So what we have done is we've designed this trial. And it was quite difficult to do actually, because we needed to find treatments that we could apply, you know, in Zambia and, and in, in Indonesia, um, and as, as well as, you know, Florida or wherever else. So we, we had to find, the, the hardest thing was finding the intercrop that um, people would be, have access to seed and, and be willing to plant everybody across this range. So this, um, so the, the basic trial is, you have, you have four treatments, um, uh, 
we, we have um, basically it's it's a treatment with minimum tillage and mulching and you know, the basic conservation of agriculture and conventional tillage and that is crossed with uh, planting with uh, these uh, intercrops of cowpeas. Cowpeas was the only legume intercrop that we could find that could be um, accessed right across that whole area. And so the basic module is just those four treatments, but then you have optional modules that you can add to it, such as different intercrops up here. We've got some uh, ground, ground nuts. Um, we also have a module for, if you're doing it on station trial, you can do larger plot because the plot size and the, and the spacing of the plants is all predetermined in the, in the trial protocols. Uh, but we have an option to, to use uh, larger plots. We have an option to use um, uh, local plant spacing, you know, if, if, uh, because the plant spacing, we're using 90 centimeters between the rows. Uh, but in some wetter systems, they would be using narrower spacing. So we can, we can modify it that way. Um, and so on. So there's there's different ways of modifying it so that you can get some tailored um, results that are relevant to your uh, site. Um, so we, we have, um, so far we have the US and uh, Nigeria, a couple of countries in Southern Africa there, India, uh, Cambodia, and um, uh, so, sorry, not Cambodia, uh, Myanmar, and possibly Indonesia as well being involved. Um, like I said, the, the protocols are, are all laid out. We have these uh, these. Hey, can you move to the slide to, of this? We can we can only see the agroecological approach slide. Do you have a slide? We we can see the picture yeah, of yeah. people in the field. I don't know if you maybe that was it. Maybe that was the slide you wanted to show. Which which one is that? This one? I can see the the okay. the cartoon. Is that okay? Oh, no, it's not. I'm sharing a different photo. I wonder why it's not gone moved on. Um, all right, I'll stop the share. Yeah, sometimes you have to stop share and then reshare and click on that specific one. Yeah, let me just um, go down and I'll reshare it. Huh. Okay. So do you see that? Yes. You see that now? Okay. Yeah, we can see a global trial. Yeah. So that was what I was um, talking about, the different uh, things. Um, maybe, can I go down? And, you know, I don't know if it's not working properly. So. Um, it's following now, it's changing slides. Okay. So we have all the protocols laid out. We have the, the field sizes and the design. As I said, we're doing double alley uh, maze with the intercropping strip in between, the intercropping. Um, we've got a process for randomizing the layout of the plots so that you get, so that's all properly done. Um, and this is all managed through a uh, data platform uh, where you, you log on, you set up your site, you know, you choose which optional protocols you want to do and so forth. And then um, based on that information, it then generates the, um, the randomizations and it, person, it uh, personalizes the, the, the forms so that, for example, the enumerator's names are there, the farmer's names are there and so on. Um, so this is... Um, so yeah, we, we set it up this way. So I, I think this is a good opportunity for, for um, broad scale collaboration because the, cre the critical thing that's perhaps hard about, you know, when, when you have a, a pesticide, like a synthetic pesticide, um, the variation that you'll get, you know, you, you're basically, if, if you're using it in the US or you're using it in Africa, or you're using it in Indonesia, you're gonna get the same response wherever you, use it pretty much. I mean, there's some variation as to whether you dilute it properly or you use it in the morning or the evening and so forth. So there are some parameters that uh, vary its effectiveness, but it, on the whole, it, it basically works the same wherever you do it. Agroecological approaches are not like that because they depend on the background ecology of the system. Um, and that depends on, you know, 
you know, whether you're in a dry system or a wetter system, it depends on whether you're in a landscape which has lots of natural forest or very little natural forest and so on. So one of the important things to do about agroecological approaches is to try and understand how they work across different settings. And so the idea of this global trial is that by having lots of different settings and do, repeating the same protocols over a very large uh, number of sites, that we can gain some understanding of that variability. So yeah, I'll stop sharing there and maybe we can carry on with the discussion. Yeah, I think that kind of leads into one of our next questions, which was um, from Serge on our team. How can young entrepreneurs get support from experts to scale up these research findings and make them more available to farmers? Yeah, so actually this is quite an interesting um, question. And I've toyed with how, how best to do it. I mean, obviously there are some, um, you can go down routes of how to improve extension services. Um, so using, you know, just the funding and an improvement training extension offices, all that kind of stuff. Um, and obviously that's all very important. And then there's the whole thing about using uh, more modern communication tools, farmer networks like, uh, you know, WhatsApp networks for farmers, um, but also, you know, platforms where people maybe identify the pest and then, um, you know, submit their data as well. David is very involved in, in those kinds of things. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, the, the, and the, those are uh, good approaches as well, um, and certainly important. I also think that it would be very interesting to see what potential there is for a more commercial approach. Um, small scale businesses uh, establishing that have the capacity to, um, for example, breed up um, parasitoids and offer, um, offer um, uh, biological control services. And, and this can probably be tied to a package in which they offer a diversity of services so they, they can they can sell the cards with the because in the um, uh, as part of the talk you saw at uh, FAO you had Ivan Cruz who's, who's um, from Brazil and they have this wonderful system where they have these cards and they're just like a little piece of cardboard in which the eggs um, of the um, parasitoid are there and they just sell these for you know, whatever it is, 30 cents a card, and you put out 10 cards to a hectare, and then you have your, your control service. And there's just no reason why we couldn't have, um, you know, small scale companies setting up in Africa who could provide very similar kinds of services. And then there's all sorts. They could be breeding um, uh, assassin bugs as well. They could be breeding, you know, or they could be building and selling, particularly if they're selling to commercial farmers or to villages, they could be, you know, building bat roosts and and, and these kinds of things, you know, the, 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 the sort of list goes on. What you need is, um, well, first of all, you need the, the young entrepreneur who, who has the interest and the knowledge, because um, it, it's the knowledge actually is not that difficult to access, it's there. Um, but obviously it takes somebody to, to say, okay, I'm gonna take that knowledge and I'm gonna turn it into a commercial product. And then probably they need some kind of startup assistance but maybe that could become through a government program for young entrepreneurs or maybe a, a donor program for young entrepreneurs. Um, but I think there's a real interesting potential uh, to, to sort of um, scale out these things um, using the commercial model. And I think it's when you look at what farmers really listen to, more often than not, they listen to the agro dealer. So making yourself the agro dealer is perhaps one of the, the best ways to get the information out there. Uh, we will have uh, Dr. Cruz presenting next week, we hope, um, certainly because of this reason. So, and just for your information, the, the Dream Team is its own company. Um, they set up a company uh, with colleagues at Moy University. So just this is a point. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, I don't know whether they operate in, in Kenya, but there is a, an organization called Prospero which operates through the British Embassy. And it is exactly for this. It's for developing entrepreneurship in um, developing countries. And so I'm, I'm gonna be talking to them about this for, for Zambia and, and uh, Malawi. So somebody wants to talk to them about Kenya, I, I think it would be a great idea. That's great, yeah, yeah, please put us in contact, super. Yeah. 
Yeah, that would be really great. Um, I can already see all of our team members' minds just spinning with all the potential and possibilities. Yeah. Um, well, I, I don't have any links to Prospero, but I just know that they exist. So probably best to go to the, uh, the British Embassy website and find out more from there. Yeah. All right, great. Well, I know it's um, at the hour, and that's what we had originally invited you for. Um, there are some more questions if you're available to stay on for another yes, 10 or 15 sure, minutes. Yeah, okay. yeah, 10 or 15 minutes is fine. Great. Um, so then I'll just move on to our next question, um, which is from Matthew again. So met, he met some farmers yesterday and told them that the birds were very good predators in their maize fields. Um, some laughed initially, but then after more explanation, it made some sense. And so as an agroforestry expert, which percentage or parameters um, or what, what are the results you have seen from birds reducing fall armyworm populations? Yeah, so I, I have no results at all. I mean, I think it's quite difficult to understand um, um, bird you know, predation on this thing. It takes a lot of observation. There, there is one study from the Southwest US where they looked at, I think it was red winged starlings, and they, um, they actually were able to go into the, the well and pull out the, the caterpillars. They had learned how to do that. So they were quite effective uh, predators. Um, of course, a problem with um, things like birds is they, some, they can also eat um, some of the beneficial insects if they're insectivores, or they can also, um, you, you, the same things that encourage uh, insectivorous birds can also encourage seed eating birds. So sometimes you get, you know, positive and negative services from, from, from these um, organisms. Um, but the, having said that, I don't think that that is something to worry about unless you get a very specific pest emerging. Like, for example, um, I know in West Africa, one problem they have is if you allow small patches of forest around your fields, you often get um, the, the baboons occupying these forests and then they come out and they raid the fields. So that creates a, a, a direct uh, pest problem. So um, those, those situations very clearly have to be managed specifically. But in general, from an agroecological point of view, we, 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 we work on the basis of simply increasing the, the landscape and farm scale diversity, because on the whole, you will get mostly positive um, benefits from it. Um, from Duncan, they have uh, intercropping reduces fall armyworm infestation. Besides Desmodium, in the case of push pool, which other intercrops have shown success in control of the pest? Yeah, so I think this is where we, we need to sort of say that you, you need to look at different uh, places. This is where it's important to have results from different systems because what works well in one place may not work well in another. I mean, and Desmodium is, is a case in point because Desmodium is essentially a, a, a dry a dryland plant. It works extremely well in this uh, drought uh, push pull system. Um, but for example, you, you cannot get farmers in Zambia to plant Desmodium. They just refuse. They hate the stuff. So there's no point in even trying. Um, and, and we don't suffer from striga here, so it doesn't. We don't get those extra benefits either. Um, so the, the the answer is it, it, the different intercrops. The, there's a number of parameters along which you have to say how is this intercrop successful. So first of, it has to be acceptable to the farmer, otherwise you're not going to get anywhere. Um, so on the whole, um, farmers are more, we uh, are, tend to be more interested in planting crops that they can harvest. So cowpea or uh, groundnut or something um, are good options because you can harvest something from them. We've also tried velvet bean and with some success, the farmers were a bit like, oh, what's the point in doing this? Because it's, it's, it's cultivated as a cover, cover uh, uh, crop. But then they were pretty impressed when they planted their plots there the next year and they got this <laughs> huge growth from the plants. So it did kind of work in the, in the, the, the set, you know, the, the farmers admitted to us that they were really surprised how, how well the, the plants grew in the following year. Um, but obviously that's a slightly harder sell, especially initially. 
And the other trouble with, with velvet bean is it does, there is a risk that it will smother the, um, uh, the maize. So it does actually require some management. When it starts to get up very tall, you, the farmer needs to go through to the, the field and slash it. Otherwise it will smother the maize. Um, so yeah, so the answer is uh, they all work to some degree. I think I think the 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 only qualification I would say is that crops that intercrops that produce very little foliage um, don't seem to do so well. So for example, climbing bean really doesn't seem to have any impact at all, and that's kind of what you would expect because it, it's at least in in the Zambian Malawi system it doesn't produce a lot of foliage. They, they do use climbing beans in Mexico and and uh, Central America and and it seems to be effective there. So again, there's a, a difference, yeah, but we, we haven't found it to be very effective here. Um, and that seems to be related to the fact that it doesn't produce much foliage. Um, but, um, but all of these systems, so yeah, so you want to look at the, whether it's acceptable to the farmer and then, um, you know, does it actually uh, reduce the, the fall armyworm? In most cases, as long as there's enough sufficient foliage um, it'll probably be producing smell and, and obviously harboring some natural enemies, so you're okay. Um, and then the other benefits you want to look at are things like, is it kind of be economically harvested or does it produce, is it a cover crop, does it produce um, improved for soil fertility and so forth. Thank you. Um, so then we have another question and or another question from Mercy Tata would agroecological approaches work well on a larger field compared to a small one yeah so that's actually interesting question and it's something that we have not an awful lot of insight into at the moment so there was a big study done in Australia which I, I got wind of but I it hasn't yet been published where they looked at the role of, of diverse uh, field margins and so these are these are margins that are deliberately sown in, in, in Australia they actually have you can go into a, an agro dealer and you can buy a package of diverse wildflowers for field margins so and these wildflowers they produce lots of nectar which feed your parasitoids and, and what they found was these have really quite a strong effect in a situation where you have very little natural vegetation in the environment. So there's very little forest of things because they have a big impact because they're the only thing that's providing food to these natural enemies. But when you actually have a very diverse situation where you've got the patches of natural forest and, and natural you know, grasslands anyway, they, they basically have almost no effect at all. So the, the additive effect in this situation was because they were providing the only habitat to feed uh, natural enemies. On the other hand, you quite often see people writing, um, I don't know how, to what extent it's really been tested, that you know, if you have a farmer that's, for example, applying agroecological approaches in the middle of a, you know, a valley where nobody else is, then they're gonna have very little success because it requires a certain you know, threshold of, of farmers to get over the limit to actually have an impact on the landscape. And it's probably true that both are kind of correct, but they're working on um, in different directions. So um, the, uh, I think the answer is it, it kind of has to be looked at um, in detail for the spe specific uh, natural enemies that you're looking at, and also the, um, uh, the, the pest that you're trying to control. In, in the case of something like parasitoids, they're very small organisms, so they don't need necessarily a lot of habitat to allow them to persist. Whereas if we're talking about, for example, bats, and bats are, are very important predators of, of full army one. They eat a, the adult bats eat a huge number of the adult moths. Um, you know, they, they obviously need a much more diverse landscape. They, they've got to have places to roost. They've got to have places to feed when they're not feeding on, on, on the adult moths. They've got to have access to water so they can drink and so on. So it's, uh, you wouldn't expect uh, bats to do very well until you get like a good uh, landscape scale in intervention. That was a good question. Um, so we had someone, uh, Valentina in the chat, like another question around the 
cyclical nature of, of planting maize. And so when you have a continuous cycle of off season maize production and delayed planting and then second season planting as well, you have this continuous maize um, production. And so um, that is one factor enhancing the availability of a suitable host for fall armyworms throughout the year. So is there a successful farming system that we can advise farmers to adopt in order to deny the pest a host? Yeah, I, I think that, um, yeah, so the short answer is no, we haven't worked it out. Um, but um, several points can be made. First of all, the full army worm um, uses lots of, of different things as, as secondary hosts. Not so it doesn't just feed off maize. So it's going to be there in the environment. If it can survive, um, it, it can feed on plants in the environment. It will be there. Um, the other thing to say about it is that, uh, yeah, it's true in a strong dry season when all the leaves dry up and so forth, it doesn't have a lot to feed on. So the population is probably going to go right down. And if you have, for example, an irrigated maize field, then that's like, you know, that's like just giving it dinner and it, it can it can do really well on that. And then its population can be higher at the start of the next season. But it's also true that it migrates a long way. So it doesn't take long to come in from, you know, if you've got it in Kenya and you've got wetter sites in Uganda, it's going to fly in from Uganda as soon as you've planted in Kenya. You know, it's, it's going to be there within one or two days. So it doesn't, this kind of very local scale of a farmer's plot and then, a, you know, the things is probably not so important in the case of full armyworm because of its incredible capacity to migrate. Um, having said that, I think that there are ways that we could think of using biological control and agroecology to try and uh, manage this system. So I mentioned before about the, the, the idea of using small area of, of trap crop to breed up your natural enemies. So if you, if you have intercrop over most of your field, you know, but you say reserve 5% of it, um, maybe slightly as set as slightly aside, where you don't do any intercropping at all, and you just grow your maize, and you basically, that's a sacrifice crop to a large extent. But what you're doing for that is you're using that to augment the, um, the abundance of your natural enemies. So that's where you would use a biopesticide. It's much cheaper to, to, to spray your biopesticide on five, you know, on an area that's 5% of the crop than it is on the whole crop. Um, and that's also a way if you wanted to try and breed up uh, to release natural enemies, you know, like uh, parasitoids and so forth, that's where you would introduce them so that you breed up that population quickly and then they would they fly out into the main field. So I think that those kinds of approaches are actually quite good. So what you can do is instead of seeing it as a problem that you have these two crops in the year where the pest builds its population on the first crop and then um, is there to, to hammer the second crop you see it as an opportunity to build up your natural enemies in the first crop so that they are ready to control the pest in the second crop. But it, it, it does require, sorry, I've got um, light coming in sideways into the um, office. Um, it does, it does um, uh, require a little bit of thinking about how you're going to manage it. <coughs> I really like the idea of shifting that perspective um, to view it as an opportunity to increase your, your natural enemies. Um, I think that's really helpful as well for the team to hear when we run into situations where um, it's our, our typical message or our education delivery system is, is not as well suited for every farmer. And so sometimes we get into challenging situations of explaining the different viewpoints and, and the options right. the farmer has available and them understanding and want, as you mentioned earlier, wanting to participate in that as well. Um, yeah. So that's a good way to phrase it. Yeah. I, I think it, it has to be said that agroecology will not be able to control um, pests in every situation. You know, pests have a biology, which means that they have this, out, this kind of potential to outbreak. So if they get ahead of their natural enemies, then suddenly the population grows exponentially and they, and they, they escape uh, the natural enemies. And then that's why you, you think of this pyramid. The idea is that the natural enemies increase the mortality of the pest, so they, they prevent the risk of that escape. But every so often, maybe, maybe not even every season, you know, it's like every third, fifth season, 
they will, for whatever reasons, they, they will start to escape the pest. And that is when you need to use your botanicals or your biopesticide. Um, but ideally, you use those. And even if they're a bit more expensive than the synthetic, the thinking should be, I don't want to damage my natural enemy community because then next year, I won't have them to control my pest and keep it below that threshold level. But we should also, when we're talking about and trying to sell the message to farmers about agroecological approaches, we should be appreciative of the fact that they're not going to be, it's not going to be sufficient in all situations. And so there may be a case for making an intervention um, such as uh, using a spray in, in some situations. Yeah. In fact, I heard some information that there was a very, very heavy pest outbreak in Kenya uh, uh, earlier this year or something. I think it was in some of the drier areas of Kenya. Um, uh, which is, you know, because here in Zambia, we, we've been studying it for now three years and we, we just don't see that many pests. Yeah. I mean, they're in every field, but the, the numbers are just so low um, and it's so it's kind of interesting to know that there are other examples where, where the, the pest pressure is really that much higher yeah, yeah I know uh, our Kalifi team can sure account for the amount of at least fall armyworm pests that they're finding in fields it's and we can send you some pictures later but it's every field they come across and they're posting every day about it yeah yeah, no, I mean, we have them in every field. So mm -hmm. at the field scale, it's 100% infestation, but they, the populations are just kept very low by natural mortality factors. They just don't escape the uh, uh, things. But I think it, a lot has to do with the levels of rainfall and as well as the agroecological environment. Yeah. Great. Um, well, I think we can take one more question if possible. Um, and this wraps into a little bit into a new topic of carbon uh, capturing and harvesting real in relation to agroforestry. So Winnie had asked, um, what are the factors to be considered to increase carbon harvest in agroforestry? And then are there target groups or locations that can be highly involved to escalate the carbon harvest? So, yeah. I mean, the, the, the whole thing about carbon markets is, is it depends on your baseline uh, situation. You have to show additionality to the current situation. So if you're in um, uh, a situation, for example, let's say like where you, you basically have no trees in your landscape, but it's a, a tree biome, then even you know, just plant, uh, planting boundary trees around your fields would add quite a lot of carbon and you could probably find uh, um, a capacity to, to sell that carbon as a, as, a, as a to verify it and sell it. On the other hand, if you're in uh, a sort of um, agricultural environment, like I, I know, for example, not far from Nairobi, you, you have um, small order plots where you have lots of trees already there. So it's, it's going to be difficult. First of all, it's going to be difficult to do the surveys. Uh, but it's also going to be difficult then to show how much more carbon you're really contributing and whether there's actually space for it. Because, you, you know, if you're going to add a lot of trees in order to gain carbon, that comes at a price uh, from the, or the, the land that, that has to be given up comes at a price for, for the farmer's field. So you've got to be very clear that there are, you know, are there spaces in that landscape where you could actually plant more trees? Um, or is it already a high carbon landscape? Because as I say, the markets only pay for additionality. You, if you're in a landscape where people have just traditionally had a lot of trees, you don't get paid for that, unfortunately. Um, so that those would be the, the critical things. The only kinds of crops that really store a lot of carbon in um, agroforestry systems are your shade systems, such as your shade cacao, your shade coffee, your shade tea. They, they can start store quite high amounts of carbon. But again, it all depends on the additionality that you're getting. If you're going from a natural forest or, or a shaded system with a natural forest canopy, and then you replace that with um, you know, shade, fast growing shade trees, you're actually decreasing the amount of carbon in the system. So you're, you're, you've got a negative carbon balance. So that, that's not gonna work. But if your start point is sun tea, and then you're planting shade trees into that sun tea, then obviously you 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 increase the sound, the carbon uh, 
in the system. So you, you could potentially market that. Thank you for that answer. Um, it was very helpful to understand. Um, so I think that we do have a few remaining questions, but maybe it would be best to put them in a document. I can send them to you after the after this sure. and, and get some answers out to them. Um, there was one attendee member, Catherine, you had raised your hand, um, and I know that she works uh, with livestock and pastoralist communities in northern uh, Kenya, so I'm hoping her, do you uh, allow her to talk for a moment? Sure. Catherine, go ahead. Hi, Annalise. Uh, sorry, I, I wasn't I wasn't raising my hand, but I just want to say thank you for the informative uh, discussion we've had today. We we're really learning a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Great. Well, that's a perfect way to wrap up then. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so, well, thank you for your time and answering all the questions and going through and giving a, a brief um, retalk from last week. We'll be posting the recording uh, once we get it on to our YouTube channel and then our Plant Village website as well. Um, and if there are any remaining questions, I'll be sure to follow up with you on that, but we'd love to stay in touch and contact with you and have you back on again um, in the near future, maybe after we talk with Ivan as well. That would be really excellent. Okay, no problem. Thank you very much. Yep. Great, and you and you really uh, set a high bar for, for yeah. future <laughs> presentations. So thanks very much, Red. We, we really yeah, appreciate well that. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Great. Cheers. Thanks for all the questions. Yeah.